Welcome to a breaking news sound of extra here on the Sala Monster Sounds of YouTube channel. I am the Sala Monster, uh, an extra here that uh, I am really, really sad to have to record. Um, but the news broke a few hours ago as I am sitting here recording this. Uh, actually, Jim Ross, I think, on his Twitter was the one who really broke the news uh, that WWE Hall of Famer Bobby the Brain Heenan. One of the great legends of the wrestling business has passed away, 73 years old. WWE has already put a statement out. I'll just read a little bit of it here to you. Uh, WWE is saddened to learn that Hall of Famer Bobby Heenan, regarded by many as the greatest manager in history, has passed away at age 73. Uh, with a career spanning more than four decades, Heenan was the brain Behind some of the most prolific superstars in history, members of the Heenan family in the AWA and WWE read like a who's who of sports entertainment, including Nick Bockwinkle, the Black Jacks, Big John Studd, King Kong Bundy, Ravishing Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig, the Brain Busters, Arn Anderson and Telly Blanchard, Harley Race, and Andre the Giant, whom Heenan led to the ring at WrestleMania 3. Uh, that doesn't even include everybody. Uh, he did manage Ric Flair for a while. He even managed uh, Terry Taylor and uh, the Brooklyn Brawler, although there are some of the <laughs> lesser uh, prolific uh, people that he's managed. Uh, this was a punch to the gut. Uh, I got so many thoughts running through my head right now. I haven't even had time to, to sort of wrap my head around this whole thing. Uh, but I just wanted to to push an update out just so I can, you know, not, not have to wait a week to talk about Bobby Heenan. I certainly didn't want to have to wait until next weekend uh, on the podcast to do it. But it's kind of eerie because I was literally at a friend's house this afternoon after I recorded the podcast. I went over to a friend's house. We're hanging out there for a while. And I don't even honestly remember how we ended up on the network, but we, we brought the WWE network up. And I wanted to show him a segment from one of the old Tuesday Night Titan shows. Uh, I had been reminded recently of a segment that I first saw a number of years ago where Vince McMahon was doing a comedy segment on one of the TNT shows. This, this was all the way back in 1984. So that's how far back this goes. And it was called Advice to the Lovelorn. And it was him and Bobby Heenan. It was the first sort of uh, installment of, I think, a few that they did of the uh, Advice to the Lovelorn segments where uh, fans, women, I'm sure it was all made up, but they would write in with questions that they wanted a wrestler, a, a, a superstar to answer for them. It could be about uh, sexual things, relationships, or what have you. But anyway... I, we're watching this because I wanted to show him. Vince McMahon is hysterical laughing in this segment. And Bobby Heenan is his usual funny self as well. And we're literally watching this. And then maybe not an hour later, uh, I see the news on my phone that Bobby Heenan has passed away. So that was a little eerie. Um, what do I want to say about Bobby Heenan? You, If anybody's listened to my podcast for any length of time, you guys know my thoughts on, on Bobby Heenan, and I, I have no qualms about sitting here, not just because he's he's died, but uh, I have no qualms about sitting here and admitting that I think he's the greatest of all time. And not just in terms of managers, you know? I'm not qualifying this by saying the greatest manager. That goes without saying. He is hands down, bar none, the greatest manager in wrestling history, period, end of story. And there have been a lot of great managers. In fact, the you know if you made a top three, most people's top three... Uh, and people might rank them in different order, but you hear the same three names. Bobby Heenan, Jim Cornette, and Paul Heyman. And Heyman's not done yet, and Heyman's a good one. Although Heyman doesn't call himself a manager, he calls himself an advocate. He's more of an agent. But as great as those guys are, nobody could hold a candle to Bobby Heenan. He was the quintessential pro wrestling manager. He was great at what he did. There was never anybody better, and I don't think there ever will be. Especially because the, the art of the wrestling manager isn't exactly uh, emphasized today the way it was 20, 30 years ago. So it goes without saying he's the greatest manager, but I honestly think that Bobby Heenan may, he may well be the greatest just wrestling performer. Because he actually wrestled. He actually did wrestle. He did a little bit of everything. He wrestled, he managed, he did announcing, as many of you know. 
He was sort of the jack of all trades. And there's an argument to be made for somebody like Ric Flair, who, who also had the gift of gab like uh, Bobby did, although maybe not as, as funny as Bobby, but, you know, obviously Flair, uh, his resume speaks for itself. I, I really think that Bobby Heenan will go down and should go down, and, and for me, uh, will go down overall as one of the greatest of all time, just as a performer in general. And as a manager, he's an easy number one. And I don't think I am um, exaggerating that at all. Uh, my first memories of Bobby Heenan were not so much from his AWA days. Uh, they were from his WWE days because that's what I grew up on in the early 80s growing up in the Northeast. I didn't grow up in the Twin Cities and the Midwest. I didn't grow up on the NWA. I grew up on WWE. And when he came over, which would have been around 84, actually 83, 84, is when he came over to the World Wrestling Federation, um, he was a manager. You know, that's what he was. I don't think he really started doing commentating on a regular basis until about 85, 85, 86, uh, around the time Primetime Wrestling launched. If I remember correctly, uh, I think it was a, a case where Jesse Ventura had been doing the early episodes of Primetime with Gorilla Monsoon. And when Jesse would not, you know, would, would be unable to do a show or maybe they took him off, Heenan would fill in, or Heenan was his replacement on the show, and that's how uh, the Bobby Heenan Gorilla Monsoon pairing really started on Primetime Wrestling. I'll talk about Primetime in a second, um, but you know I have so many memories of, of Heenan and one-liners, and you know memories of him managing all of these big names. It felt it really did feel like Bobby Heenan managed any heel in the company that was worth a damn at some point had Bobby Heenan as their manager. And I know not literally, but it felt that way. And when you think about some of the biggest heels at the time, obviously Andre, when he went heel, uh, Heenan, you know, was was ringside for arguably one of the most, uh, po maybe a popular, but famous uh, championship matches in wrestling history, the Hogan-Andre match at the Silverdome. But you think of King Kong Bundy, you think of Big John Studge, you think of Harley Race, you think of Paul Orndorff, and then, of course, you have the lower card guys in teams like the Islanders uh, and Mr. Perfect and Rick Rude later on. And like I said, Ric Flair, even briefly for a time when Flair first came in. Remember, it was Heenan who was carrying the big gold belt when Flair first came into the company. And I guess he went on the road with Flair and he's told the story a lot about how he couldn't, he just could not handle it. <laughs> he could not handle life on the road hanging with Ric Flair because he just wasn't going to survive. And that's when he told the company, I'm not managing anymore. I'm going to transition full-time into just being, you know, the announcer and nothing more. And so they uh, paired Flair off with Mr. Perfect when Perfect was taking time off and Perfect became his executive consultant. I believe the terminology was that Perfect was the executive consultant and Bobby Heenan had sort of transferred over to being the financial advisor. I believe that's how they, uh, they billed him. Uh, Heenan, you know, I don't, I'm not going to go through his whole background, uh, I'll leave that up to other people, and, and Heenan himself, who, uh, you know, Bobby Heenan had a book that came out a number of years ago, in fact, and this is also kind of eerie, I just, uh, got done talking about Bobby Heenan, uh, only a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, I got a mailbag question about Bobby, and I think the end of his run in WWE, and I was talking a little bit about that, and I never miss an opportunity to talk about Bobby Heenan or tell Bobby Heenan stories on the show. So I had the chance to, to talk about him a couple of weeks ago. And I got a very nice tweet uh, from uh, the gentleman who wrote, or ghost wrote, I guess, his first book. And I think actually they, he just celebrated, I think, the 15-year anniversary of the publication of that book. He sent me a very nice tweet. He sent me a photo, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, from when the book first came out of him and Bobby at a signing somewhere. Uh, Steve Anderson, I believe his name is. And if I got that wrong, I'm very sorry. But I'm just going off the top of my head here right now. So that was really cool. And that was not even like a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and now this. Bobby, one of the interesting things about Bobby that I think a lot of people probably uh, don't realize, especially if you're a newer fan, if you're not as familiar with Heenan, uh, and even if you were, 
not everybody knows the guy's life story, but one of the things I thought that was very interesting, and Bobby talked about this in interviews, is the fact that he never even graduated from high school. Uh, I believe it was the uh, seventh or I think eighth grade. He dropped out of school. He was a, he was, I mean, would that even qualify for high school? I mean, where I went to high school, high school started in ninth grade. I don't know how it was back when Bobby went to school. Technically, he may not have even gone to high school. Uh, but in eighth grade, he dropped out of school to support his family because that's what he had to do. And he ended up in the wrestling business. He got his start and made a name for himself first in the AWA. Again, he did wrestle. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you know that Bobby Heenan had a bad neck, the reason he had a bad neck was he sustained a very serious neck injury, uh, if not had his neck broken, in a match in Japan back in 1983. That's where his neck issues stemmed from. Many, many years later, he would need neck surgery. That was one of the reasons why he left uh, the WWF, uh, among other reasons, was uh, for the insurance and to be able to take care of his neck. So that that's sort of the, the early years of Bobby's career. You know, the whole weasel gimmick, people calling him a weasel, the weasel suit matches. That stuff started before he even came to WWE. And did the weasel suit matches with the Ultimate Warrior and all that. That was a gimmick going back to the AWA days. And of course Vince raided the AWA and brought over Bobby and Gene Okerlund and Hulk Hogan and, and a bunch of those big names. Uh, and, you know, Bobby, if you listen to him in interviews, he's he's had mixed feelings about the AWA. You know, he, he acknowledges he had a lot of good years there and, and really made a name for himself there, but... He's also, in other interviews, referred to the AWA and the, and the people there as all the world's assholes. Uh, so not, not completely fond of, you know, Vern and the AWA. But he came over to WWE at a time when you had Jimmy Hart and Lou Albano and Fred Blassie was still around and Slick and, you know, all these different... Oliver Humperdinck, you know what I mean? Like all of these different managers... It was sort of a golden age in many ways, I think, uh, in wrestling for, for pro wrestling managers. And if you count the a the uh, NWA, you had J.J. Dillon and Pauly Dangerously. And it, it's, it makes me sad that it's not like that anymore because I do think in a lot of ways it's, it's a lost art. And I would love to see this great rebirth of managers where we have this just plethora of different people, you know, in that role. Uh, but, you know... Him and Gorilla Monsoon are what a lot of people are going to be talking about here in, in, in the days to come as they recap his career and they share their memories about Bobby Heenan. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, him and Gorilla together as an announced team, I don't care what anybody says, they are the single greatest, most entertaining wrestling announced duo ever. And I've actually ranked them. I've gotten mailbag questions from people asking me to rank my favorite announce teams before. I'm sure you can find the clips. They're all over YouTube. Uh, I always rank Gorilla and Bobby at number one. And that's not to say that Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler were not a good team and that there weren't other good announce teams. None were as good together and as entertaining as Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan, who on the air hated each other. Obviously, behind the scenes, they were the best of friends. Uh, Heenan raved about Gorilla, absolutely adored him, and that's why they worked so well together, because they were just, there was a natural chemistry there where they could just riff off each other and play jokes on each other and say these horrible things about each other, and then when the cameras were off, they can go laugh about it. And there's so many great memories of skits that the two of them did back in, you know, primetime wrestling. They would go on location for these shoots. Uh, and, and they would tape these funny skits, and even when they were on set together, you know, they were always cracking jokes on each other, uh, just a natural chemistry. Like I said, I, I rank them at the top of my list all the time, and behind them I'd put J.R. and King and, and Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura, also a favorite of mine, but none were better than Gorilla and Bobby, and so many great memories of the two of them together, uh, those of you who uh, listen to the show are also well aware of my fondness for the 1992 Royal Rumble. Uh, to the point of absurdity at this point, I <laughs> comically will drop references to that as often as I can. People rib me for it. Uh, but there's a reason for that. And I maintain and always will maintain that the 1992 Royal Rumble match is the greatest Royal Rumble of all time. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
You know, the, the way they booked Ric Flair to come out at number three and outlast all the other guys and all the names, the star power in that match from Flair to Hogan to Savage to Sid to, to DiBiase and Bulldog and Kerry Von Erich and Roddy Piper and on and on and on, Undertaker, Sergeant Slaughter. But Bobby Heenan's commentary, you got to remember, the biggest Ric Flair fan when he first came into the WWF was Bobby the Brain Heenan. He was his biggest cheerleader. And he kept telling people, Flair is the true world champion, the real world champion. And all throughout that match, every time Flair was in jeopardy of being dumped out of the ring, he would be just, (laughs) he would be on the verge of a heart attack. And Gorilla Monsoon had no sympathy for him at all. And of course, they bantered back and forth and the ring would empty out. At one point, Flair was the only guy in before the next guy was to come out, and Heenan said, I'll just give him the title. And of course, you know, Monsoon said, I'm not giving him the title. And, uh, uh, you know, that's not fair to Flair became a, a popular line. I still remember when the Barbarian came out. And there's another guy that Heenan managed at one point, the Barbarian. And uh, Barbarian comes out, and Heenan's talking about him, and he's like, you know... Uh, when the Barbarian, I managed the Barbarian, and he barely liked me. And he said, you know, what do you think they call him the Barbarian for? You know, he's not a hairdresser on his day off. Just like quick-witted lines like that. Uh, There was another point in that Rumble match where, uh, I think it might have been Flair actually gave, I think Undertaker, if I'm remembering this right, gave him a low blow. (laughs) He lifted the Undertaker, I think it was like about five inches up off the mat. And uh, he actually said, I think he tried to lift The Undertaker. But there was another point. I, I think there was another point where there was a low blow. Or, or Heenan was talking about doing whatever it takes to win. And he said, you know, I, w- I would do that to my grandmother if I had to. And of course, Monsoon deadpan, like, yeah, I bet you would. Just so much great gold in that match. And of course, when Flair wins in the end, Heenan loses his mind. He goes nuts. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody thinks Daniel Bryan, or uh, was it Diego Sanchez, I guess, came up with the yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, 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 no. Bobby Heenan did, my friend. Go back to 1992. Little known fact there. <laughs> if you want to if you want to be really technical about it, it was Bobby Heenan doing the yes chant long before those guys were. Uh, nobody was happier than he was. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the post-match promo in the back with him and, and Mr. Perfect, you know, we're not the kind of guys to say, we told you so, but we told you so. It was, it was just absolute gold. And uh, I will forever fondly remember the 92 Rumble in large part because of the commentary from Bobby Heenan. I think single-handedly the greatest night of commentary uh, of, of Bobby Heenan's career was that night. I could go on and on about other moments. I mean, some of the ones that stand out to me, obviously the barbershop incident. It's amazing to me that after all these years, and we're talking like 25 years now, something like that, of all the the talk show segments and angles that they've done in this company and angles that have happened in wrestling, one of the most fondly remembered of all things is the barbershop, which think about that. You had a guy who was, he portrayed a barber gimmick and he had a talk show segment that didn't last that long. I mean, if you think about it, the barbershop was only around for... How long was it around for? Was it even around for a year? Maybe a year? I mean, the concept of it is so silly, and yet to this day, people remember that segment with the Rockers. You know, there was a rift between Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, and they patched things up, and they shook hands, and Heenan is talking about, uh, you know, or, or it was Heenan or Monsoon was talking about how, you know, they're better together than apart. And then, of course, Shawn Michaels super kicks Janetti in the face and Heenan immediately starts talking about, I knew he was going to do that. I just knew it. I just knew he, he doesn't need Janetti. And then the famous moment where Shawn throws him through the window. <laughs> and and uh, and Heenan says, what a coward, you know, but Marty Janetti tried to dive through the window to escape. And Monsoon was incredulous. As if that moment wasn't wasn't more memorable enough. Again, another Heenan gem adds to the moment. Uh, I think back to the 1993 Survivor Series, which I believe that was in fact the last pay per view that he did as an announcer for WWE uh, until he came back many years later for the Gimmick Battle Royal in 2001. He was on fire during that show, at least during the Hart Brothers match against Shawn Michaels and the Knights. So Jerry Lawler had to go away for a little bit. He was having some legal problems. That's why it didn't really make sense for Shawn Michaels to be teaming up with a bunch of knights. But 
There you go. And it was against Bret Hart, Owen Hart, Bruce Hart, and Keith Hart. For the first time, I believe, in uh, WWE, we had Bruce and Keith wrestling a match. And Bobby Heenan just was merciless. <laughs> he was absolutely merciless uh, in just dragging the Hart family and mocking Stu and Helen Hart and how old they were and, uh, and the brothers. You know, now Bruce was a substitute teacher who, who used to wrestle and now he was coming back to wrestle in this match. Keith Hart was a fireman. He might have been a volunteer fireman. And Bobby had some fun with that, but my favorite line of all the jokes during that match, of all the insults, you know, he's talking about Bruce, and he's talking about Stu and Hell, and he goes, you got nine months to come up with a name, and the best you can come up with is Bruce. <laughs> Just the way he said it. I'm not even doing it justice. Uh, but right up until the end, his last pay-per-view for them, only a few weeks before Gorilla Monsoon kicked him out of the building on Raw, and he left the company. Right up until the end, Heenan had that wit about him. He was awesome. I, I really, in his entire time in WWE, he never lost that. He never lost that. I was not as much of a fan of his work in WCW, because you could tell when he gave up, you can tell that he just, he just didn't care anymore. And as the years went on, he started to, he really, he was mailing it in there at the end. Again, Maybe within the last couple of months, I talked about Bobby Heenan on the podcast and an interview, a shoot interview that he did many years ago, talking about how in WCW he wanted to contribute ideas. He would go to Eric Bischoff and, and he would pitch things and he was shot down. And Bischoff even, according to Bobby, even said to him at one point, look, Bobby, we don't pay you for your ideas. We don't pay you to you know, tell us how to produce this segment or offer this creative idea. We pay you to announce. And that was it. At that point, Heenan was like, forget this. You know what? I show up. I do my job. I cash my check. I go home. I don't care anymore. And it's really a shame that uh, that's how it had to happen and they couldn't tap him as a resource. When he was clearly willing to contribute and willing to help, that his help wasn't uh, needed. His help wasn't wanted. And you, like I said, you can kind of tell... As the years went on in WCW, and he neared the end of his run there, that it, this wasn't the same Bobby Heenan from, you know, even five years ago, let alone 10 or 15 years ago. But right up until the end in WWE, he never lost that, he never lost that, that uh, you know, that, that talent that he had. He never lost the wit. He never lost his wit. He always had that. He was always funny. Uh, even in the later years when he was suffering and he really, he could barely speak and he was going through everything he was going through with the cancer, I mean... His mind was always very sharp. It was almost like he was trapped inside his own body. That's what made it so sad. Uh, but right up until the end, Heenan had that, that sharp wit about him. And a lot of people have said this, and I agree, that if Bobby Heenan didn't go into the wrestling business, he would have been an entertainer. He would have been in show business in some way. I don't know if he would have been a stand-up comedian. I don't know if he would have been a television writer or a talk show host or what. He was that talented that outside of wrestling, he would have excelled in whatever he did. He would have made people laugh. We were just lucky enough that he got into the wrestling business, and we have all these stupid, <laughs> these stupid memories of, of him doing stupid things from over the years. But he would have excelled in in comedy, in entertainment, somewhere, somehow, whether he was in wrestling or not. We we were all just very fortunate that he chose this field to be in. Uh, but just again, just randomly thinking of some other moments. I mean, there was one where uh, he was announcing with Tony Schiavone, and. Uh, <laughs> I remember reading about this years ago, and I actually didn't remember it, but then I saw the clip. Uh, I, I think I, I probably found it on YouTube or something, but uh, Jim Duggan was wrestling, and, and Tony Schiavone made a comment about how, you know, well, boy, you know, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, he's really at a disadvantage here in this match, and Bobby Heenan goes, he's at a disadvantage when he wakes up in the morning. Uh, I think back to WrestleMania eight, the very beginning of the show, they had Reba McIntyre come out to, to sing whatever it was, either the, the anthem or America the Beautiful, and as the pay-per-view is starting, the opening match of WrestleMania that year in 92 uh, was Shawn Michaels, his first singles match of Mania against El Matador, Tito Santana. And as Reba McIntyre is leaving, Tito is coming out, and Bobby Heenan, of course, made the crack about how uh, it's nice that Tito has an opportunity to, uh, to say hello to his sister, you know, a Reba McIntyre. <laughs> it's just so stupid, but 
I still I still laugh at a lot of these uh, jokes. And let me tell you, Heenan told a lot of jokes, as a lot of guys did back then, that if he told them today, oh my God, you, you talk about getting run out of town on a rail uh, at the slightest joke that's like racial in any way. I mean, look, it was a different time back then. This stuff happened. This was commonplace. Uh, I'm not condoning all of it, but uh, there was there was a lot of that type of humor that that you know Heenan uh, was was a part of also that just wouldn't fly today. But it was genuinely funny, and that was one example of it. Uh, I'll, I'll always remember one of his great phrases, which is, of course, "A friend in need is a pest," which is partially true, by the way. He did come back uh, to WWE in the gimmick battle royal at WrestleMania 17. They invited him and Gene Okerlund to come in to do commentary together. Uh, that was really cool. I remember I remember watching that live, actually, and I was hoping that this would be the start of something. They'd have Bobby back, maybe not full-time necessarily, but, you know, it was so cool to see the brain back in WWE. He always felt like an outsider. He felt like a foreigner, a guy in a strange land in WCW. It just never felt right to me, so for him to be back in WWE, come back at WrestleMania, it just felt right, and it sucked that that was the last time we got to see him in that kind of role. Uh, they did bring him back for a comedy skit at WrestleMania 20 at Madison Square Garden. He did some some funny stuff, him and Gene, with uh, Moolah and Mae Young. They did a skit together. That was it. That was the last we saw of Bobby Heenan on WWE television really doing anything for them. Uh, he did get inducted into the Hall of Fame that same year that he did the skit at Mania. That was in 2004. He got inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. Uh, still, in my opinion, the greatest Hall of Fame speech... Again, other people may have their own. That's my favorite. My favorite WWE Hall of Fame speech is still to this day the Bobby Heenan one that he gave. He was having so much fun, uh, and he had already been affected by by the cancer. His speech, you know, he was he was struggling. He could speak, but he was struggling. Um, but he was having the time of his life up there, and uh, to see him up there telling all the stories and, and and still cracking jokes and cracking up the entire room, even after everything he had been through. And for as funny as the speech was, for him to end the way that he did, uh, you know, he ended with that line about Gorilla, because Gorilla Monsoon had, uh, had passed away in, uh, in 99. Actually, Gorilla Monsoon died on my birthday in 1999, uh, which I remember that. That was quite the kick in the crotch, because I was a big Gorilla Monsoon fan. And I could never understand, you know, why he would always, you know, later on when, when I would look at like the Observer Awards in, in like uh, in the Observer Newsletter, like year after year for all those earlier years, you know, Monsoon would win the award for like worst wrestling announcer. I'm like, worst wrestling announcer? <laughs> Especially compared to today, he'd be the best. What the hell's wrong with these people? So I never understood that. But again, the two of them were so close that when he passed away in 99, Heenan insisted... Uh, and was able to go on Nitro, which was the competition. He went on WCW television to open Nitro that night, and he was able to give a quick eulogy to uh, to his friend. And you could tell that he was really affected by that. Even as he, he eulogized him, and then Tony Schiavone sort of quickly moved along with the show, it was hard for, for Hina to keep a straight face. I mean, it was really it was painful to watch him sitting there trying to not just absolutely lose his shit uh, after eulogizing his his friend. And so anyway, fast forward to the Hall of Fame speech in 04. Funny, entertaining, like this is great. And at the very end, he starts to tear up and he gets very emotional. And he says, I only wish that Monsoon was here. And every time I watch that back, I it, it's hard for me not to, you know, for... for <laughs> You know, for the uh, the ninjas not to start uh, chopping up some onions in front of me. It's um, it's just a great speech, and I encourage. I would imagine it's on the network. I don't know uh, if if they have a section with all the Hall of Fames on the network, but if it is, you should definitely check out that speech or find it. However, you need to find it. You can probably pull it up online somewhere. It's a great speech. Uh, Heenan went through hell with the throat cancer. I think that's pretty well documented. He was diagnosed with it early. In the 2000s, probably was around 2002, I believe is when he was first diagnosed. Uh, I, I think he beat it. It came back, if I'm not mistaken. 
And he had many years after that, he had to have reconstructive surgery from all the radiation and everything. I mean, it, it really just destroyed his, his jaw, like his jawbone. And he had to have reconstructive facial surgery. And, and if you've seen the pictures of, of Heenan in recent years, it's shocking. It is absolutely shocking. It would be shocking to somebody who did not know what he looked like in his younger years. For people who remember him looking a certain way from TV for all those years, you see, you remember him then, and you see him in recent years, and um, it, it's it's a it's a shocking transformation, and it sucks what the cancer treatment did to him. And and let's be honest here, and I unfortunately have a lot of experience with my own family with this, it isn't always so much the cancer that does it, it's the treatment from the cancer. And when you have to undergo aggressive treatment for cancer, unfortunately it can have uh, a lot of awful side effects. And Heenan went through hell. One of the things I'll always respect about Bobby Heenan, because people have their own opinions about whether or not Bobby should be even going out anymore and doing all of the conventions that he was still doing. And I got very angry about this. Again, I talked about this on my... I sound like a broken record here, but I, I've talked about Bobby a lot on my show, and I got very angry once when somebody had made a comment on like a YouTube thread that I saw. Why is he doing this? Why is Bobby going? He's scaring kids. He, why does he still go out and do these conventions? You know, and I got really pissed off. Because first of all, who the hell are you to say what this guy should or should not be doing? Or that he should or should not be going out. You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like the gall of some people to even make a comment like that. I respect the hell out of Bobby Heenan for the fact that even through all the stuff that he went through, and however, whatever his appearance may have been, he still went out, he did the signings, he did the conventions, he made appearances. I don't know if it was purely because financially he felt he had to. My sense of it is that he enjoyed it. He genuinely enjoyed going out and meeting people. I'm sure if he didn't want to do it, it would have been very easy for Bobby Heenan to just lock himself away at home and live out the rest of his days. But I always was reading about Bobby Heenan's going to appear at this convention. Bobby Heenan's going to be making an appearance at this convention. And I thought to myself, my respect level for this guy has gone up infinitely because he doesn't care. He doesn't care what other people think. He wants to go, he wants to mingle, he wants to meet the people, maybe he wants to see some of his old friends, some of the other wrestlers. And I'm I'm grateful, personally, that he did that, because I finally, after all these years and growing up on the guy, I had the chance to meet him. I went to my first WrestleMania in Miami, WrestleMania 28, so we're going back five years already, and they had a convention, at, now they have conventions now every single year. At the time, it was the Wrestle Reunion. And I think that was the last Wrestle Reunion convention they did. Now it's WrestleCon. I guess that would be the equivalent now if he was to make an appearance at one. It was Wrestle Reunion. I bought a ticket. And why did I buy a ticket? The only thing I was really interested in was I wanted to meet Bobby Heenan. That was one of my main missions on this trip. Yeah, it's cool. I'm going to go to my first WrestleMania Rock and Cena and all that. I wanted to go to this convention so I can meet Bobby Heenan. And get a picture with him. And I did that. And I and I put the photo up on my Twitter. I wore a shirt. I don't remember where I bought it. It was from one of these custom like t-shirt sites. And it said, that's not fair to flare. I still have it here. That's not fair to flare. And I said, I've got to wear this shirt. <laughs> You'll think of a total mark, which, okay, fine. But I got to wear this shirt. And I'll never forget. And I think... Uh, I think I have it on video, actually. I think my friend recorded it, and I have some of the video on my phone. But I get to Bobby in line, and his wife was always with him at all these appearances. And she was she was a sweetheart. She was a very nice lady. I had the chance to meet her a couple of times. I get to the line, I get to the front of the line, and Bobby, you know, is all animated. And he's pointing at me, and he's looking over at his wife to get her attention and just pointing at me. And it took me a second to realize, oh, he's pointing at my shirt. I thought I did something wrong. Like, he thinks I stole something. And I'm like, oh, no, he's pointing at the... And he's pointing at the shirt. He's giving me the thumbs up. I'm like, that's all I needed to see. He was he was over the moon about this shirt. He was entertained as all hell by it. And um, <clears throat> I got my photo with Bobby Heenan, which is awesome. 
Um, that's why I, I'm like more of a, and I've, I've said before, I'm more of a photo guy than an autograph guy, uh, because the photo will last forever. You know, it's, 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 it's a memory that, uh, you know, nobody can ever take away from you. I mean, a, an autograph, okay, that's, that's nice and all, but now I have this photo of myself with Bobby Heenan that, uh, that I'm really happy I was able to get. I really am uh, very happy I had the chance to meet him, and uh, it was brief. I, I did see him earlier this year when I was doing the Fight TV interview stuff at WrestleCon. I didn't have a chance to actually, um, like, go over and, and say hello or, you know, or get another photo or anything like that. I, I kind of wish I had now, but uh, he was there, you know, again, making, uh, making another appearance, making the rounds. Um, if you remember last year, I'm sure a lot of you guys remember last summer, there was an idiot online who was impersonating Bobby on Twitter, and everybody bought into it. It seemed legitimate. In fact, I think some of his friends in the business may have, they even bought it. They fell for it. And so when you see other people in the business and, you know, friends of his who are acknowledging, hey, Bobby Heenan's on Twitter now, follow him here. It's like, well shit this is legit this is the real deal and you think to yourself this is the coolest thing in the world you know bobby obviously has a lot of issues speaking it makes total sense social media it would be a great platform for him because he can you know interact with fans and he can communicate with people that way and i think it, it goes to show the impact that this guy made and all the fans that he had uh, and, and still has, that people got so excited at the idea that Bobby Heenan was actually on Twitter and interacting with people and answering questions. And this went on, I think, for a few weeks until finally somebody got to Bobby's wife, and Bobby's wife said, this is not him. I don't know who this person is, but please spread the word. Bobby is not on Twitter. He does not have any social media accounts. This is a fake. This person is an imposter. And I was really bummed out by that. I think a lot of people were really upset. They got their hopes up and then uh, sort of got punched in the gut for it. And uh, it's too bad that that uh, moron was never caught because that was not cool. I don't even know what would really possess somebody to do something like that, honestly. Unfortunately, there's some really sick people out there in this world. Um, you know, hopefully he'll, uh, it'll come back to him at some point in life, one would hope. But... Uh, the reaction to that alone, just, you know, the excitement that everybody seemed to have when they thought that Bobby Heenan was actually on Twitter. Uh, it is kind of a shame that he never did really embrace social media, because I do think a platform like Twitter, uh, it would have been it would have been fantastic for him to be able to utilize that to even just promote his own appearances and stuff, let alone interact with people. And uh, it's a shame that, that that never happened. But uh, I mean, I could go on about Bobby. I'm just going stream of consciousness here, so if I'm rambling, I apologize. But um, my hope is that on TV this week, and I have no doubt they'll put together a very nice video package for him on Raw and SmackDown. Um, and I look forward to that. And hopefully he'll get a, a good response, you know, when the video airs. But I really think, you know, he's deserving of a 10-bell salute. They don't do a 10-bell salute for everybody, but they've done it for enough people before. And I think that for all he gave to that company and his contributions to the wrestling business in general, in, in and out of WWE, if anybody was ever deserving of a 10-bell salute, it's Bobby the Brain Heenan. And I sincerely hope he gets that treatment on TV this week because I think he absolutely deserves it. And he will go down, uh, for me at least, he will go down as uh, the greatest of all time. As just an overall performer in the wrestling business. There's never anybody better. There's never anybody more entertaining. Uh, a lot of his humor, a lot of his jokes to this day, it still cracks me up. You know? Sometimes stuff gets very dated and it's not funny. Jerry Lawler, I, I, you know, Jerry Lawler is another example of somebody who's very funny and has a, a wit about him. And there's a lot of old Jerry the King Lawler jokes that are still very funny to this day. And then there are others that, you know, like one-liners that are very dated. And uh, there's there's a little bit of that with Heenan. But by and large, you go back and you watch those old matches and the old, uh, you know, insults and jokes and everything else. And it still holds up to this day. So I'm going to spend some time this week with whatever free time I have. Catching up on some Bobby Heenan content on the WWE Network. I know I'm going to be doing that. Uh, and, uh, and, and I encourage all of you to do the same and by all means, share your memories of Bobby Heenan, your favorite memories of him as well in the comments down below. I'd, I'd love to hear what you guys think 
and uh, share your memories of the brain or if you had the chance to meet him or interact with him even at some point. Uh, but this is, um, you know, he, he's been in really bad health over the years. I'm not exactly sure exact, you know, exactly what um, led to his passing, if it was anything specific, if he had suddenly gotten sick with, you know, some kind of uh, new illness or something. I just know he was in very poor health for a very long time. And um, this was not something that uh, I, I, I guess was completely unexpected. Um, but, you know, Bobby, I know one thing that really was very important to Bobby Heenan. I know this because he talked about it in older interviews and people that knew him talked about it was how much his family meant to him. And I, I alluded earlier that one of the reasons he left WWE in 93 was insurance and he wanted neck surgery but i know for a fact that one of the reasons um had to do with his i believe his daughter uh was going to college either in or somewhere close to atlanta and so to be closer to his daughter he wanted to go work for wcw and that had a lot to do with it as well family was very important to bobby heenan when his health was really critical a number of years ago uh, one of his kids, I believe, was about to have a baby. And I remember the talk at the time being Bobby really just wanted to hang on to see the birth of his grandkid. That's really what he was sort of sticking around for and really looking forward to. And this is a number of years ago. And, and Bobby, um, you know, not only stuck around for the, the birth of his, you know, grandkids, but he stuck around a lot longer than that, uh, which is really cool that he was able to to enjoy that aspect of his life. So... Um, I don't really know what else to say at the moment. I'm sure if I have other thoughts or if there's other news about his passing and what led to it, we can talk about that on the podcast next weekend. But again, I didn't want to wait an entire week to get this off my chest and share my thoughts and memories of Bobby Heenan uh, while it's all fresh on my mind and, you know, I'm thinking about all these things. So uh, I'm going to take off here. Uh, leave comments down below in the comment section. Like I said, share your own thoughts and memories of Bobby Heenan from over the years. Uh, I am the Solomon Monster. Be well, stay safe. Uh, we'll see you back for a brand new full podcast up on iTunes, Stitcher, and all the usual platforms next weekend. Plus, No Mercy uh, is next weekend. We'll have a review up here on the YouTube channel uh, later that night as well. So until then, take care, guys.